And the second strand was that it degraded, it morally degraded the society that used it. But by the end of the 19th century, a number of other strands of state practice and philosophy had come into being, which were that agencies were growing and had grown by the beginning of the 20th century, that dealt with espionage or military intelligence or police investigation or state surveillance of all of those agencies that were not susceptible as it was considered to the normal legal restraints of the state. They were somehow to be exempted from it. And in parallel, growing over a longer period of time, had been the concept of the exceptional crime or the exceptional situation. And the history of the 20th century and the 21st century has been in large part the tension between those concepts. The concepts that there are forms of state work or forms of state agency that should not necessarily be trammeled by the rigid restraints that apply to everyone else. And that there have been exceptional circumstances or crimes or situations that mean those restraints have to be abandoned or temporarily sidestepped. And that's the history of the last 10 years. That tension between what is sought to be used for the state as against what the state well knows, knows absolutely is prohibited con conduct. Inalienable rights, absolute prohibition on the use of the worst of crimes, torture. We have a paradox in this time in which we find ourselves, in that this is an age of vast state strength, by and large. Our state and our comparable, comparable states have the ability to mobilize vast resources, possess virtually infinite means of coercion. And yet, much of state policy has been predicated on the basis of extreme state vulnerability to its enemies, external or internal. And it's this unsettling combination of vast power and infinite vulnerability, as it is seen, that has made 20th and 21st century states neurotic and extremely ambiguous in their approach to things such as human rights and the state's willingness, or state would call it necessity, to employ, employ procedures they would otherwise never dream of. So in this sense, torture has a history. And that helps us understand that we can't simply write it off as a personality disorder, as a person who is the foot soldier in perpetrating it. We can't shrug it off as racist brutality. 
an accidental pathology of an individual human being, but an incident of public life <clears throat> in this century, which is not restricted to formal criminal legal procedure, but occurring in other areas under state authority too. Now, when the government, the new coalition government last year, announced that we would have such an inquiry, it was welcomed by the now opposition Labour government, Harriet Holman, said we welcome this. We have done so much to rectify abuses of human rights. We, the previous government, worked so hard to bring back British citizens and residents from Guantanamo so that now there is only one left. It wasn't just hypocrisy. That was a dreadful lie. When the men who had been in Guantanamo, British citizens, came back and initiated civil litigation against MI5, MI6, the Attorney General, the Foreign Office, the Home Office for complicity and torture. After two years, grudging disclosure began to be given. And the disclosure was of emails between government departments in January 2002, the very time the first men were being transported, just like slaves in slave ships, chained in rows and planes across the Atlantic to unlawful, wholly unlawful detention. At that very time, the emails say from the Foreign Secretary, send them there. The longer they stay there, the better. Home Secretary. For my part, they can stay there forever. But before you send them from Bagram Air Base, an unlawful place of detention, brutal, keep them for a week or so so our agents can see them first. And the Prime Minister, the email coming from number 10, says the email, from number 10, if it's a choice between giving consular access to a man detained in Zambia or sending him to Guantanamo, refuse consular access. There's a hypocrisy. The methodology for removal of torture, a worldwide understood methodology, necessity to remove the phenomenon of torture. First, to achieve data that is unarguable. Who did what, to whom, when, how, and then to find those responsible, to bring them to book on whose watch it happened. And to avoid that, states adopt tactics and have adopted tactics that use torture, stealth torture, so-called, doesn't leave marks, standing hours, days on end, stress positions, extreme noise, sleep deprivation, or, as they did in the US, you change the terminology to indemnify those who are involved against criminal prosecution. Waterboarding, said the Attorney General, US Attorney General, is not torture. It redefines torture, as well as all the other, the whole area is laden with euphemisms, intensive interrogation. But in this country, there really isn't the need for that. We have a problem, and the problem is our absolute 
reliance on secrecy. We're enslaved by secrecy in this country. And although the new coalition government forswore the past and forswore torture, they have not forsworn secrecy. <coughs> The thesis is that the state is our protector. The state ensures the security of the nation, national security. And when the state plays that card here, it again and again and again trumps everything else. There is no way to know. So the inquiry that has been set up is intended, as Cameron said, to get to the bottom of what happened, saying to clear a stain from our reputation as a country is immediately shrouded in secrecy. None of the evidence, save for that of the victims, is to be heard in public, not to be heard in public at all. The chair of the panel has overseen, a retired judge has overseen the working of the intelligence services for the past four years. That's his job. And each year he's tick, ticked it off as being fine. So he's a witness, but he's the tribunal of fact. He's the inquiry. <clears throat> There's no power, non-statutory inquiry, no power to compel the attendance of witnesses. And when Haig, William Haig, speaks of being candid about our engagement with countries that don't fully share our values, that's what he said, then how do we engage with countries that don't fully share our values, as he claims? Can the UK extradite to countries that perpetrate torture, can we, should we? Our government argues that we can and should. There is a constant legal battle going on as to how should the European Convention of Human Rights apply to countries outside Europe if we are sending people to a certain destination of torture. Can the UK deport countries that torture. We say we can, provided we have an assurance from Gaddafi. This is not very long ago uh, that he will not torture Libyan dissidents here if we send them to Libya. There's a foundation that will ensure their safety, the Gaddafi Foundation, headed by Saif Gaddafi. This was a battle that went on hard fought in the courts here, just by a whisker those Libyan dissidents weren't sent back. We impose control orders upon men, so far men, based on secret evidence. And we find sometimes when there is a WikiLeaks publication that what is likely to be the secret evidence, which the individual will never know, has ricocheted off someone tortured in Ethiopia to someone tortured in Guantanamo and back again. The curtain doesn't lift for very often and only accidentally. Five minutes left, good grief. I hate to do that. All, all of this is going strong. Maybe in facing up to the past, the most essential thing is knowing and understanding what we did and how we did it. And ironically, it's a hundred times easier to go to the US and speak to US interrogators at Bagram and find out what the British did and who was there than it is ever to dream of finding out here. If you talk to men who've come back from there, debrief them. They'll talk about sitting in stress position day after day in razor wires or freezing cold in the middle of an Arctic Afghan winter 
with nothing on them but the thinnest of shirts and patrolling in the razor wire, they say, if you tell them a mile off, two by two, the Brits in the North Face Jackets, they saw, they were present in unlawful sights and they saw the torture, they were complicit. Now, just lastly, is you will recollect perhaps very recently walking into the courts on the Strand, some elderly men and women, once upon a time, now, now, 50 years late, they came to bring an action in the courts here for the ways in which they were hideously tortured, the men castrated, the women raped. And at the very time that they went into court, a Foreign Office archive was discovered that showed everyone knew. It wasn't simply the British Army officers who did it in Kenya 50 years ago. It was the ministers, Foreign Office, civil servants knew. And so the one moral we can draw from that is if there had been prosecutions, name and shame and sent to prison for life, if it's complicity in the worst of crimes, murder, torture, if all of those involved had been tried and convicted, we would never have had the use of torture in the north of Ireland. We would never have had our complicity in torture in the last 10 years. We wouldn't have it. There has to be an accountability and it is simply not enough to sink it yet again into secrecy.